Everybody talks about generating code with AI and that's a very, very important topic. And with me to talk about this today, we have Adil Ali of uh, Appymatic. Hey Adil, thanks for joining. You just turned 10, well not you, but your company, congrats. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me, Eric. Yeah, it's been a decade now. We have been just like, you know, working in this space and knowing you. Yeah, actually, we, yeah, we've met a lot of times, so it's nice to have you here. Thanks. Um, so, so you've been doing code generation for 10 years, which is much longer than most people have been doing it. But nowadays, everybody thinks about code generating AIs, like Copilot, GitHub Copilot was kind of a big revelation for a lot of people. What do you think about these trends and what do you think about the generated codes? What are good ideas, maybe not so good ideas? Yeah, you know, when when ChatGPT came out, I quite liked it. I love playing with it. And when it came to uh, generation of the code, I did find some reliability issues. But uh, having, you know, worked in this space for long enough, I know that ChatGPT's strength is not, you know, in, in uh, reliability, but its strength lies in understanding my input and create, you know, dynamic results out of it. So, you know, if you look at the generated code from uh, an AI, it does not, like, it's always syntactically correct. So the syntax is good, but it does not understand the semantics behind that code. So often it, uh, you know, goes into hallucinations and other problems. Yeah, that's a, it, and it reminds me a lot of what the those chatbots generally are doing these days, right? You ask them a question and they give you a response, which always sounds good. It just every now and then it's just wrong, but it still sounds good, right? So it sounds like a convincing answer. So when you look at this, like being not so reliable, like what do you think is the the reason for that? So why shouldn't we just trust these these? AI agents and say, oh, you, you go and write the code, it's going to be fine. Yeah, you know, so the, the main issue is uh, like on internet, there are so many options and which seem right. But when it terms, comes to code, it's hard to pick, for example, like there are thousands lines of code and you need, I need like the AI sees uh, code, which looks syntactically good but there are so many options it picks a wrong one. So it leads to a problem which we call the determinism problem, that there are multiple options and it picks the wrong one, which looks right. Second problem is a very famous one, which is which we call hallucination. So it can make responses when there is, uh, isn't a real one. So yeah, uh, we see a lot of advantages, but with those advantages, we have to, you know, take care of uh, some of these, uh, you know, underlying issues. Yeah. And I really like this, this example you gave in your presentation recently, you know, where you kind of was, were leading into that, right? It's like, why is the Golden Gate Bridge painted white, right? And it's like, well, it's not, but that's not what the AI will tell you. So w w when you think of how unreliable it can be, on the other hand, also what kind of possibilities is open up? What do you think is a good way of using AI to help with generating code? Because it can still be helpful if we better manage those problems, right? Oh yeah, definitely. That's a great question. You know, first we need to understand that there's a difference between automation and artificial intelligence. They are two different things. So if you need to do a complex and well-defined task faster than a deterministic code generator could be a good option. However, if your task is like not well-defined and you are still like, you know, want to explore the options, then chat GPT or AI is a great companion to do brainstorming with you while, you know, until you find a desired output. And when you look at those two things where you say like automation and AI are different things and they both are useful in different scenarios. Where, where do you think, you know, we should be going in particular, you know, you're working in the API space. I'm working in the API space. We're interested in APIs. So how can AI help us to work with APIs in the best possible way? How do we combine those things? Yeah. Again, great question. I would say, so if, 
if like you know imagine i am a developer and i am just looking at this new api which i want to consume the first thing in my mind would be to understand how this api like you know the concept of the a this api for example how many types of types of billing option are supported by this api or what's the limit of the api calls in, in a free tier so these are the concepts which do not involve any code, but I need to understand the API before I write my first hello world. So once I've understood that, uh, so, so right now, understanding an API, the options we have is, you know, uh, our API docs or forums, or you can say, you know, uh, some PDF documents, but as a developer, I have to read each and every bit of it. What if I simply ask, you know, chat GPT or Gemini, about these concepts, just write a question, and it just like to traverse through all the docs and give me the precise answer. So that's the dynamic part where AI can really help. And versus just if I just like you know go through each and every page of the documentation. So that's the first step. Second, where I am now starting to write code, and imagine like you know I am working with a fintech application and I have to resolve OAuth 2.0 multiple legit. So to understand how it works, then write code about it. This is pretty complex task. So at that point of time, if a traditional code generator, like, you know, like API Magic, so let me, you know, plug my company in. So if you use API Magic, that what it can do, it can automatically generate the whole authentication flow for you in multiple languages. The beauty is that the code is deterministic. So you will not get the problem of hallucinations or determinism because every time you will get the exact same output if one developer is using or if thousands of developers are using so you get deterministic and uh, you know same code so number one was understanding the api concepts number two was writing the access code which is not the business logic which is static now the comes the interesting part the most interesting is the business logic for example i want to use this api for xyz reason and you want to use this API for ABC reasons. Both of these are different use cases. And if I ask ChatGPT to give me a code, which can use like, you know, the deterministically generated code from an SDK or from a code sample and then build a use case for me, then that's a very interesting use case. Uh, I think if, if companies reach to a point where their developers can just like write a query, about using an API and get the whole application sorted out for them, that will you know, serve a great purpose and they could be able to create applications without writing any single line of code. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what you're advocating for, just trying to summarize what you were saying, use AI to explore an API and, and better understand what it does, how you may accomplish your tasks just in terms of the, the logics of the API, then in terms of the interactions, because the pure mechanical interactions are very deterministic. You can just use a traditionally generated code, not, not AI generated, but de deterministically generated. And then once you have that, that gives you a very good, um, we could even say like a foundation model, right? Maybe something like that to use oh, some yeah. AI terminology, oh. <laughs> right? It's, it's, that's something you can ground then your code building into, right? So is that like, that's the, the model basically that you're advocating? Yeah. So what I'm advocating is that like, you know, let's play on the strength of, of both because in API consumption, we have both dynamic and static part, AI is good with dynamic parts. So let's use it for dynamic use cases. Traditional code generators like API-matic are static, you know, they generate a static code, which are like, which can cover the static parts of the API consumption code. So let's combine both uh, the strength of both and help developers. I like that. And I think, you know, like stating the obvious here, I guess, but I think that's really where the true power of AI often comes in, like with people deciding when we should use it and people deciding when we should not use it and then combining those things in the smartest way. And I think, so you have something, you, you have a co-pilot, is that in, in beta or is that already, I, I looked like a few weeks ago, there was something that was in beta. Is it still in beta or is it out now? No, it's still in beta. So to be honest, like, you know, 
I was quite skeptical last year when, when like, you know, when AI came out and like, you know, people were trying to use consume APIs and I was like, you know, I've been working with automatic code generation since the days of rational rows, if you, if you remember. So reliability is always, you know, a question. So I was not giving it, you know, much consideration until one of our interns, she showed me a, a, a working, you know, like training AI on API magic generated code and it was uh, showing some promising results and that was almost like eight or nine months ago and I thought okay let's uh, try doing it but when we dig a bit you know dug a bit deeper we found that this is not as easy as it sounds because yes you can feed AI the the generated code but it still has to stitch all those endpoints and it still needs to determine that which of the endpoints are actually, you know, uh, right for, for this use case. And that point, you know, uh, we are still like, you know, uh, refining it. And uh, so far the results are quite promising. I would not say they are hundred percent there yet. So it's still like, you know, we call it a private beta. But uh, some of our, you know, uh, customers are using it as private beta, and and uh, it's, it looks very promising. And you also have, and I think you know, we, we're running out of time here. But I really want to talk in more depth with you about that, maybe in a future video. You do have your own like epimatic specific way of how people describe workflows, right? And that also goes into the training data. Then, oh yeah, so you know. Uh, workflow is a natural way to use a use an api and uh, since like you know open api did not have uh, a specific way to describe uh, you know changes now <laughs> and that's the great thing you know i'm hearing a very promising things about you know the new new version which is a very great name azaro something like that Arazzo, actually, I always get it wrong too. It's like it's it's Italian for tapestry, and yes, it's a workflow specification. Finally, um, but you know, like to me, it actually it seems a lot like almost like a validation of you know what you've been doing for so long. It's like yeah, workflows are valuable stuff where a lot of really relevant information can be captured. And um, I find it fascinating, you know, to see that you, you've been doing that for a long time. Now you're doing something very specific. And now we may actually get it or we do get a specification where we may see more tooling evolve. You know, so, so you look at, you know, this logo, it contains a finite state machine, which is representing sort of workflow. And yeah, that's how, you know, the APIs work in real, but uh, we call them stateless because, you know, all the state management is is uh, not evident like, or like not given to developers. So we just like, you know, have to maintain that state externally, but this workflow with this workflow specification, it will really help. So before that, uh, we like, you know, introduced a at API Magic something called guided walkthroughs. So uh, with an API, we can describe four or five use cases, which are common and developers can just like, you know, go through them. Step one is this, click, try it out, the code runs, and they, go, they reach the next step. Step two, try it out, and the code runs. And after five or six steps, they complete the use case and get the code, which is, you know, uh, their, uh, according to their own input and their own use case. So guided walkthroughs is something which is quite popular at APMatic. And now I'm quite happy to see that, you know, uh, it's becoming uh, part of, the workflows are becoming part of open API specification. Yes, and part of an interesting application of AI technologies that you're doing. One last question, just because I'm always, you know, trying to figure out how people are actually doing it. So, so what you're doing to me sounds a little bit like the, this RAG architecture, retrieval augmented generation. Um, is that something, would you say what you're doing is RAG or not RAG? Or I think it's a pretty fuzzy term. So I'm just curious. And that's a great question. So, yeah. So if uh, you, like, there are two types of questions. If you learn the API concepts, you are dealing with the text, right? For text, RAG is great model. So yeah, we are using RAG of to uh, to help with the you know the textual queries. But when when it comes to code, you cannot just like you know break code into RAG chunks. 
So those, those vectors, so we are using sort of rag, like the concepts are there, but <laughs> but it's not exactly implemented. So we have like modified rag for that. Ah, that's interesting. And that's kind of, I mean, that's kind of because you have two co-pilots, right? You have the one co-pilot that works for the first phase, the discovery phase, and then you have the, the co-pilot that actually works for the coding phase. And for these two, you do. And that's the, that's just the kind of stuff I find fascinating, you know, like people figuring out how can I put together the different bits and pieces to create the most useful thing. Great way to put it, Eric, you know, I think you answered it. And, <laughs> but I will I will come back to you, you know, later uh, in a few weeks, maybe. And I really want to talk more about those guided walkthroughs and the workflow specification, because I think that is something where I see a great future. But let's do that the next time. For now, Adil, thank you so much for joining. Um, it's been really interesting. Do you have any closing words for us, you know, for people to maybe what they should check out or, you know, what you think is the most interesting thing to look out for in the next couple of months? Yeah, so... Uh, I think uh, user feedback is great. So we are, we are all here to make the technology better. So if uh, you can just like a try out uh, that API co-pilot, which you mentioned, I can, we can, I think we can give the link over here and give the feedback, like, or, or just say what things you want to see in that. That will be great. And uh, keep uh, building great APIs and great use cases out of them. That's it. Okay. Great. Thanks again, Adil. And thanks everybody for watching. If you liked it, please give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing and until next time, keep getting APIs to work. Bye everybody. Bye.